welcome back everybody to another episode of the Adventure Guide. And I can't begin to tell you enough how much I appreciate each and every one of you that come and visit this channel. Also, if you have a channel of your own, be sure to talk about it and tout it in the comments below. Alright guys, in this episode, we're going to cover the numerous hotspots of Goatman in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, also known as the DFW. Little do people know that in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, the Dallas-Fort Worth area was completely encircled and under siege by Goatmen. Let me share with you what I was able to dig up about stories and locations of these Goatmen so that you can go out and investigate this stuff on your own. Starting off with the Old Foamy Road Monster in Claiborne, Texas, but I believe locals pronounce it as Cleburne. Most of the early accounts that seem to have started in the 1950s and went into the 1960s is that if you drove on Old Foamy Road, you might encounter a goatman eating roadkill. The goatman was known to hurl the rotting carcass at cars as they passed by. Caches of bones could be found along the roadway, though many speculate that these caches are from a cult that has been and still is in the area. According to a newspaper, Richard Dickerson, the former archivist for the Johnson County Historical Commission Museum, attended Cleburne High School from 1962 to 1966. And the newspaper stated, Dickerson said he recalled hearing tales about the creature when he attended school in the 60s, making this the oldest known account of Goatman in Texas. The road is a tragic place with a dark history and documented dark events taking place on it. In the 50s and 60s, there were caches of bones that were found along the road, and this drew a lot of suspicion of cultic activity. There is definitely something about this place that attracts people with a dark nature to it. For instance, on January 24th in 1980, a married couple named David and Joyce Ingram had a massive blowout, and Joyce told David, that's it, I'm leaving you. Not only that, but she also told him she was going to take every penny he had and he was never going to see his son again. With that, David snapped. And according to his testimony, quote, At that point, I flew into pieces and I started choking Joyce. I grabbed her neck and started choking her. She was struggling, but not a lot. After a minute, she quit struggling. I let her go and she collapsed on the bed there in the room. I walked over to the crib and put my hand over his face and nose and mouth and held my hand there until he stopped breathing after a minute or two. David Sr. then threw his wife's body into the back of the truck and his little baby David in the truck with her. Then, according to David, he, quote, drove out South Main to Rio Vista, then turned right to go to Ham Creek. I stopped on the bridge and I threw Joyce's body off the bridge. I came back on 67, the same route I had taken to go out there, and turned on Old Foamy Road, and went to the low water crossing. I put the baby's body, still in his green sleeper suit, inside the trash bag, and into the water on the left side of the bridge. And he's talking about the Goatman's Bridge on Old Foamy Road. For some reason, he was drawn there to dispose of the baby's body. This is the home where David Wayne Ingram lived with his wife and son. Police figured that the crimes were committed here, but the bodies of Ingram's wife and son were not found here. They were found miles away. Ingram is being tried first for the death of his young son, a son who was named after him. The body was found in a plastic bag on a county road just outside of Cleburne. Prosecuting attorneys figure this case is more emotional and will be easier to get a conviction. Emotion is running high in Johnson County. Threats have been made against Ingram. I've been told that some of them have come from the family of Ingram's wife. Another popular story is that a car of teens were killed trying to summon the Goatman, which involves parking your car near Buffalo Creek, turning off your headlights, and honking your horn three times. Apparently one couple did so, but they decided to park on the bridge and they turned their headlights off. Another car came, hit them, and killed them. Now, I don't know if that story is true or not. I didn't dig through the newspapers to verify this, but it is a popular story. In 2015, a head-on collision killed a couple on the road, and then also this event. This photo was taken on February of 2020 by someone who found the vehicle in this condition and reported, quote, I found a empty SUV, what appears to be going off the bridge like they lost control. I stopped. 
got off of my truck and started recording. The SUV was empty, but the back was open. And I looked back at the video and I see a pitch black figure going out of the SUV and into the forest. Still watch the video and can't explain what it is. Also back in 2015, two ladies were searching for some abandoned puppies on Old Foamy Road. One of the two ladies named Vicky Raincrow discovered a massive cache of bones and said, quote, I came over the ridge here and started shouting, Bones! Bones! It looked like a large crime scene out there. A couple named Timothy Hall and Kristen Carver attempted to build a satanic temple in the Goat Neck area near Old Foamy Road. They appeared on the Jerry Springer show sharing their plans, but before construction could begin, the two of them converted to Christianity. Another lady named Terry was having paranormal problems and started experiencing a lot of fear and anxiety, and she said, quote, and that I was going to be murdered like my father was out in the goat neck area. I could keep digging and finding more and more dark secrets, but this should suffice for documenting the excessively dark and terrifying aura and history of the place. In the 1970s, Old Foamy Road became the place freshman girls at Cleburne High were initiated. They would have to walk the entire stretch of the road in the dark at the mercy of the goat man. However, no attacks or documented encounters exist on these walks. The origins of the Goatman in old stories is from murders that took place back in the 1800s and created a portal to the underworld. A lynching of an outlaw with a noose is the most popular of the stories. Some people place nooses out to open up portals, but the most popular way to summon the entity, as previously mentioned, is to park in the dark, turn off the headlights, and honk the horn three times. Some of the more recent sightings are... Amanda in 2016 wrote, My friend and I have been there late at night many of times. Once, we saw and took pictures of nooses, ropes tied in circles, hanging from the tallest trees next to each other. This was many years ago, and we had photos of it. I will contact her to see if she has them anymore to post. But the next weekend, we were going, and they were gone. And that was eerie, considering how high up over the stream of water they were. It would have been impossible to get them down without a crane or something, especially since nothing around it, tree limbs or rocks, were disturbed. So we brought our Ouija board out there at 3 a.m. and had a flashlight on the board asking it questions. It actually talked to us. We asked, hey, is this place evil? It said, yes. Also asked, who are you? Answer spelled out, Mother Mildred. Ironic, because me nor my friend using the board knew how to spell Mildred. Before this, nor ever heard of the name. Proof we weren't just spelling it ourselves. Also asked, how did you die? The tool used for spelling, a triangular tool, which is a planchette, then did not spell out anything, but simply moved in circles fast, then abruptly stopped. And the point of the triangle was turned around 180 degrees, pointing towards the tree that previously the rope hanging from the top. The next encounter is in 2021 with Lori M. Cerro, and she wrote, quote, The legend is true, 100%. Back in 2010, my date thought of been funny being me here. He did as the legend says, and I heard goat-sounding footsteps. And he threw things at my date's truck. It was creepy. So guys, if you decide to venture out to Old Foamy Road, please do not park on the bridge. Just on the west side of Buffalo Creek is a concrete driveway to a fenced-in substation. It may be legal to park there. You can turn off your headlights and honk your horn three times, or you can get out and walk over to Old Foamy Bridge, which is right next to it. With speeding cars, deaths, colts, shadow figures, and goatmen, please be careful out there. Remember, the old sightings took place all along the road, not just at Old Foamy Bridge. From Old Foamy Road Monster, we head east to Files Valley. Somewhere near Atosca, Texas is Files Valley, and in Files Valley is a strange tunnel which is supposed to be haunted by a goatman. The tunnel has strange lights, footsteps, screams, and bloodstains appear on your clothes when you come out of the tunnel. 
According to some on Facebook, there is a giant man-made tunnel that runs under Files Valley. The entrance is secret, but after some research, I believe that they may have found a possible abandoned section of the 54-mile-long Super Collider Tunnel. It is supposed to be extremely dangerous, and they filled it with water. From Files Valley, we go northeast to White Rock Lake. Nestled within the northeast section of Highway 12 Loop in Dallas is White Rock Lake, famous for sightings of Louise Ford Davis, a ghost that took her life by drowning herself in the lake in 1935. Louise appears in white and walks the road at night with wet clothes and hair and begins bumming rides from strangers. And a number of people that have claimed that they have seen her picked her up and began to give her a ride to her location. She just vanishes. A nine and a half mile trail encircles White Rock Lake. It just so happened that on a hot August day in 2001, a lady named Sandy Grace was jogging the trail in the heat of the day around 2 p.m. She felt this hard to explain sensation of evil and a foreboding feeling. It grew stronger as she jogged and after a minute of it, it was so bad she decided to turn around and race back to her vehicle. When out of the trees came a Krampus-looking type figure. She described it to a gentleman named Nick Redfern that it was half goat, half man. Its body was sparsely covered with thin brown hair. It was large in stature with large horns protruding out of its head. It came right towards her making eye contact and bearing an evil sneering grin. It stopped just 15 feet in front of her, dropped to the ground on all fours, and then vanished. Pam began to suffer breathing problems from what she believes may have been a panic attack that was triggered on purpose by this thing. There are some reports that the goatman throws trash at people visiting the lake, but I was unable to find a good enough account to truly present. There's been so many sightings on the lake that this beer has been named after the goatman that haunts White Rock Lake. Quote from the Dallas Morning News. The beer is named for the mythical half-goat, half-man creature said to mysteriously appear at White Rock Lake. Lake lore has it that this tall beast hurls trash and flashes menacing looks at joggers and other lake visitors. From White Rock Lake, we're going to head north to Wiley, Texas. What's strange is that this legend has been around for at least 30 to 40 years, but I can't find where the road is exactly located. However, the police even refer to some road there in Wiley as Goatman's Road. To summon the Goatman, you park, turn off your car, and headlights. Then you flash your light three times and honk the horn three times. After this, you watch to see if the Goatman will run in front of your car. On November 1st of 2012, Matthew Speecher wrote that they tried the ritual and had no luck. Discouraged and leaving, they, quote, saw something standing in the middle of the road. We weren't sure what it was, so we just kept driving. From Wiley, Texas, we head north to Plano. One account took place on a Sunday in April of 1997. Quote, My friends and I scouted the woods around Bob Woodruff Park after church to build a fort. We ended up down at Rolet Creek where we dreamed of building a fort with a drawbridge. As we went down to the creek, we saw something that defied logic. Didn't see the goatman, we saw tracks. It was hoof, human hand, hoof, human hand, hoof, Human hand, it was obvious. It was walking on all fours all the way down the shore of the creek. Even as kids, we knew what we were looking at. I am certain that our imagination did not run away with us. These prints were clearly indented into the soil. We followed a trampled down path in the grass into the woods and it came out at the science place. From there, we went home and came back with disposable cameras the following weekend. But the rains had swept the tracks away. We swore this to secrecy, but we were kids back then. Another eyewitness named Tony Martin stated to a newspaper, quote, There was a story of a goatman at Los Rios. We were told if we trespassed on the golf course that this half goat, half man would chase you and throw apples at you. He was the child of the former owners of the property when it was a farm. Supposedly, several kids who tried it had died. Don't let the goat man catch you. Yet another eyewitness, Barbie Oliver, had a personal encounter and said, quote, He was half man, half goat, and lived in the woods behind Bob Woodruff Park. We snuck out one night and went there. 
there was something out there. We swear to this day we saw him. If it wasn't him, someone was out there trying to scare us. We found a dead goat and got the hell out of there. The story is that he lived there before Los Rios was built. His family owned the land and he wouldn't leave after his parents died and the land was sold for development. He roamed those woods at night and if you were caught out there after dark, you would never be heard from again. There were rumors of several missing people that were known to have gone out there after dark. All I know is I was a believer after that night. Never would I even drive that way at night. From Plano, we go far north up to Callisburg, Texas. If ever near Park Hill Park at night, be sure to visit the bridge there. Recently, there have been several sightings. However, I can't find any of the stories that tell exactly what happened. From Callisburg, we head southwest to Denton, Texas, home of the old Alton Bridge, a.k.a. Goatman's Bridge. One of the newest spots to pop up in the 2000s is Goatman's Bridge there in Denton, Texas. Unfortunately, the most famous story about the origins of the Goatman that haunts the bridge is 100% fabricated and false. If you ever hear the story of a gentleman with the initials O.W., just know that the story isn't true. In fact, there is a current drive right now that's growing in popularity to get all videos removed from YouTube or to monetize that mention the offensive story of O.W. as being real. Therefore, if you go out to Goatman's Bridge, be sure to exclude this story from your video as being real and happening. Also, those that have done it in the past, I promise they're not racist. It was just a misunderstanding. I did a separate video on the real documented history of O.W., on my channel if you're interested in knowing the truth. Even though the OW story didn't happen, there have been a lot of encounters and there seems to be a lot of activity on the bridge. Untold numbers of people claim they have seen glowing eyes in the woods after knocking on the bridge three times. The three knocks on the bridge is the most famous way to summon this cryptid or entity. Two unnamed people were on the bridge one night, and they heard this demonic voice in a growling tone say, Get off the bridge. Numerous other groups have claimed to hear this same exact command. Some stayed and nothing happened. However, others had traumatic experiences from not taking heed of the warning. Of these two, though, one ran off the bridge and one stayed. The one that ran looked back and claims they watched their friend dragged by an unseen force to the rails and then thrown over. Shane and Ryan of BuzzFeed Unsolved also investigated the bridge and to their credibility said the OW story was 100% bogus. Ryan nervously knocked on the bridge three times, but nothing happened. However, later on as they're venturing into the forest, there's this blood-piercing scream now, Ryan was the only one that could hear it. For some reason, Shane could not detect it with his ears. However, in review on the camera footage, you can clearly hear the scream. And to me, it personally sounds like she's screaming help. There is more to this story, but rather than tell you about everything that happened, I'll place the link to the episode in the description below so that you can watch it at a later date. Sam and Colby went with Christina Collins of Call Me Chris out to the bridge and validated a story that I had heard long ago about this giant Ouija board. The way I heard that it worked back in the day was they would take somebody and they would place them on the board and blindfold them. Then they would twist them in a circle three times and that person would then allow the goatman to possess them. Then they would ask questions and then the person would navigate the board supposedly being controlled by the goatman. Sam and Colby had no idea or had ever heard of this or obviously they would not have been standing on it. As the three of them were out on their investigation, they encountered screams or high pitches of some sort, and Chris had physical contact with something there. One other member of the party was scratched on their back. If you want to see this episode, I'll leave a link to it in the description below. Now going outside of these popular YouTube channels and TV shows, let's look into some of the personal encounters that the normal everyday person has had. For instance, on December 9th of 2014, Annabelle F. wrote, My aunt visited the bridge with her boyfriend and her two friends. She was telling me one of her friends the story while her boyfriend and her other friend went up ahead. 
My aunt told the girl she was walking with the story of the Goatman's Bridge when she heard someone whisper in her ear, Go ahead, tell her the story. And my aunt told me she could feel hot breath against her neck. She swatted her hand back to hit the person. She thought it was her boyfriend, but she didn't feel anything. She looked around and saw her two friends up ahead. My aunt screamed and ran into the woods where she got lost but was found an hour later crying in a corner. She was scared when she told me about this weird event that happened in Goatman's Bridge. On May 24th of 2015, Breeze wrote, quote, We visited in June 2013. Went with four other friends at around 9 and 10 o'clock at night and parked in front of the bridge. Theory is you aren't supposed to look back at the bridge while you leave so nothing follows you. I stood on the bridge with one of my friends while the others went ahead on the trail. My friend tells me after a few minutes that her back is itching, so I put my phone light on her and I see three long scratches down the middle of her back. We call to our friends and tell them we want to leave, so they come back. As we are crossing the bridge back to the car, I tell my other friend who is not from the area not to look back, and we leave. We make it about five minutes down the road and the tire goes flat. We get out and see that there is a silver dollar-sized hole torn out of the tire. My friend that I told not to look back admits to me that she watched the bridge as we drove away. Things follow you. Don't do it. Charles Thomas wrote on February 13th of 2020, I've come to this location a lot since my first time. Every time I got three marks on me. You can hear hoof-like noises on the bridge as well as the smell of sulfur and occasional rock thrown at you. I have seen red eyes in the woods and have been pushed, made to feel sick and whispers in my ear. The next few locations are going to be better than anything we've talked about so far. However, I want to do a quick shout out to the channel, Cryptids Across the Atlas. What do you get when you mix a reptile, a werewolf, and the devil himself? According to New Orleans residents, the Grunge Road Monster's origins run much deeper than you might think. If you enjoy this channel and the way I cover cryptids, you're really going to love this one. Also, be sure to check out the band How to Live with Robots out of California. <laughs> I'll leave a link to Cryptids Across the Atlas and How to Live with Robots in the description below. Now, things are going to get more interesting. Southwest of Goatman's Bridge is Greer Island on the western side of Fort Worth. Sightings took place during nights, rainy days, and foggy days. Most of the events that took place are now located within the boundaries of the Fort Worth Nature Center in Fort Worth, Texas. A vague report states that in 1948, a man was fishing on the shore of the lake and spotted this monstrosity. As the sightings took place, it became known as the Mud Man, a half-goat and half-man entity. It got the name because it was known to be one of the three things that haunted mud flats just north of the nature center. An evil place supposedly where a ghost, a gnome, and this goat man haunts. Then sometime in the 1960s, a couple went out to Camp Joy Park to do some fishing. They put their boat in the water and they set out to fish. However, around lunchtime, dark clouds, thunder, and lightning were rolling in on them. They decided to anchor the boat, sit in their vehicle, eat lunch, and wait a few hours for the storm to blow over so they could return to fishing. The storm dumped rain so hard they couldn't even see their boat from the vehicle. They turned on the radio to get a news update, and as they listened, a loud thud hit the top of their vehicle. Assuming it was a large limb that broke free and hit the vehicle, they almost exited, when a large white figure slid off the top. They described it as half man, half goat. It made no aggressive actions towards them and simply left. However, they did too. They split. But now in 1969, a lot of weird reports are starting to take place, and they're happening mostly at Greer Island. A few years before James Kinson died in 1974, he told newspapers that he and several other friends had witnessed mist form into the shape of men. 
In the article, Kinson described the things as, quote, a great mist in the shape of men. All features of these see-through men are discernible. The entities make a great clamor as well. Now, sometime between 1969 and 1972, Kinson had also been monster hunting for this mud man, who was about to take on the new name, the Lake Worth Monster. At least since May of 1969, Fort Worth police began receiving calls about a monster sighted out at Greer Island. The police thought it was a prank being pulled on them by teenagers and just simply laughed it off. Until one night in July when everything would go haywire. Back in the 1960s and 70s, Fort Worth had a spot where people would drive out to to party or make out. It was a gravel pit on the shore of Lake Worth. Just on the north side of the pit was a bridge that spanned from the shore over to Greer Island. On July 10, 1969, John Reichert and his wife plus two other couples in the car drove out to Greer Island one night. At around midnight or so, something dropped from the tree onto their car much in the same fashion as the incident at Camp Joy Park. Something massive was on the roof. It reached through the window on the passenger side and tried to grab hold of Mrs. Reichardt's arm when John floored it. The goatman was displaced from the roof and the Reichardt's and friends sped out of the park. Bill Morris, a Fort Worth resident, was at an old cafe in the area around 12.30 or so when a car flew into the parking lot frantically. It appears an officer was parked there monitoring the road and grabbing a bite to eat. The driver got out of the car and told the officer a wild and crazy story. The driver was Reichardt. He was in an excited state and was filled with terror. The officer could tell it was not a prank and this guy was serious. Though the police always laughed it off before, this time there were six terrified victims and their eyes showed shock. One pair was married and they were visibly shaken up so bad. Something absolutely petrified these people. It was taken so seriously that four squad cars arrived. They asked Reichardt if he would show them where the spot was and he agreed. There was no evidence at the scene that would debunk or prove the claim either way, but Reichardt did show the officers an 18 long inch gash in his car by the thing's claws, but no more could be found. The goatman was described as being seven foot tall, half goat, half man, covered in hair, and possibly having scales on his body. The police had to debate whether this was a prank or not, as there was a chance you would be shot in Texas pulling a prank like this. Everyone in Texas knew it, and such pranks were rare due to this factor. But nothing else made sense to believe. The next day, this incident was reported on the radio and it stirred up a giant wave of armed monster hunters. The park was flooded with shotguns, pistols, and rifles. People walked around brandishing clubs, knives, and even a sword-like bayonet. Sheriffs knew it was just a matter of time before somebody was shot or seriously hurt. Near 30 to 40 people had congregated into the gravel pit, waiting to shoot the goatman by gun or camera. Police were parked nearby trying to keep law and order. Nature director Wayne Clark said, quote, I remember when all of that was going on. There was a number of old parking lots and the kids used to throw keg parties. They were a pretty well-behaved group but would party. But on this night, July 11th, there was no partying going on. But a crowd of 30 to 40 people stood quietly in the gravel pit waiting for a glimpse of the goatman. Among them were eyewitnesses Jesse Earl Harris, who went by Jack and Ronnie Armstrong. And according to several sources, a number of Tarrant County sheriffs were there as well. But this has not been verified, though they were definitely nearby. Some in the crowd were waiting to shoot it and become known as a famous monster killer. And then he appeared. He was seen spotted on the road and then off into the trees. Believe it or not, in front of this crowd of 30 to 40 people, this white-colored goatman stood on the rim of the bluff overlooking the gravel pit with no fear of the crowd or their guns. It anxiously ran back and forth, howling on the rim in the dark with great agility. No one fired a shot. They just stood stunned and transfixed on this thing running back and forth. On top of the gravel pit was an area where people used to dump trash and debris. The goatmen retreated back away from the crowd and towards the junk piles. Everyone stood in place and still puzzled. No one pursued it. 
Then it reappeared with a massive truck tire still on its rim in its hand. It hurled it from the cliff top. The crowd looked up in the air as the tire came whizzing towards them like a frisbee. However, the tire went clear past the crowd at an incredible 300 to 500 feet. Oh, and this was it. This was all the crowd needed to know that this was the real deal. This thing possessed wicked power that no human has, and it could tear them in half if it wanted to, and they knew it. Panic ensued as they ran for their cars. Well, it was about seven foot tall, weighed about 350 pounds, and it was hairy, and I couldn't see its face. It was in the dark. There are reports that it has scales, too. Did you notice that? I was so scared I didn't see nothing like that. It was up there on those cliffs, and it'd stay up there running back and forth. And it run, it wouldn't run the whole distance around. It just run halfway around it and halfway back. And it wouldn't run through the trail that was up there. It'd run through the, the edge of the cliff that was pretty rugged and had a lot of weeds and trees around it. And I couldn't see how no human could really get through there as fast as it could. And he threw a tar, uh, some 400 to 500 feet. Did it look like he was throwing the tire at somebody or? He'd thrown it at everybody, about 40 people. According to Nature Center director Wayne Clark, he said, quote, From what I heard, it was a total panic with everyone running into each other and burning rubber to get out of there. One source vaguely hints that law enforcement was at the pits at the time and that they fled in terror too. But another source claims that the police arrived to take a report and as they were interviewing the eyewitnesses, the thing bleated out a demonic thunderous sound. And it was at this point that the officers fled, along with eyewitnesses, in complete terror. Either way, this thing drove fear into law enforcement as well as the citizens. Bill Morris, that had witnessed the Reicharts come screeching into the parking lot on July 10th, recalls another event where one car was parked near the water's edge as the gravel pit was completely full with monster hunters. The Goatman emerged from the water. It grabbed hold of the bumper and dragged the car back far enough that the back tires were dropped into the water. Now, all of this is hitting the newspapers, and it sparked interest into one lady to get out there, document everything, and start an investigation. Her name was Sally Ann Clark. She wrote the very rare and expensive book to get a hold of, The Lake Worth Monster. However, as you can see, I care about you all enough that I purchased it to make sure that I got my research and the story correct. In the book, we find the best eyewitness of everyone. His name was Jim Stevens, and he had the longest and best look at the Goatman as it was pressed up against his windshield while he was driving for a number of minutes. Clark documented this encounter in her book on page 14 as, quote, He was out fishing when several excited people swore they saw it. Jim and two of his friends went searching for it in his Mustang at night. As they drove, the thing leaped onto the hood of his Mustang, Jim swerved back and forth in terror trying to shake it off. Jim eventually hit a tree to shake it loose. On impact, it was thrown from the car, got up, and ran into the woods. The impact into the tree did a fair amount of damage to his car. Jim had the thing in front of him long enough to see its face well. He described the thing as, quote, It was real big and human-like, with burnt scars all over its face and arms and chest. I am six foot four, and the thing is a lot taller than I am. It's at least seven feet, perhaps taller. And that ends that quote. But it's safe to say that Jim had the longest and most detailed look at the Goatman. And it's these burn patterns all over its body that gave it the perception of scales. Another excerpt from Clark's book is, quote, Linda Gilliam of Palm Springs, California, met up with Mr. and Mrs. James C. Bramlett and a friend to hunt the thing down. One disturbing find was a large catfish laying on the road, bitten half. The top half was laying there, still alive. They searched for it for a week, but never saw it. They found many enormous tracks and heard terrifying roars. One thing they noted was that the large tracks seemed to have a bobcat following them. They believed they were near it as they could smell a horrid stench that matched others' descriptions. Another young man interviewed by Clark was Gary Stanford. And his account from page 18 went, quote, A guy named Yankee was supposed to be with me, but when this thing came running out of the brush, old Yankee left me, and I had to run by myself. Gary returned with a group of friends from nearby Diamond Hill. 
Also, Gary informed Miss Clark that the thing had been called Mudman for many years before the sighting at Greer Island. Yet another eyewitness, Ronnie Armstrong, who was one of the witnesses that had the tire flung at him, he roamed the park as did hundreds of others looking for clues and evidence. All of a sudden, he started calling people in excitement to a picnic table. A crowd of around 50 came running up and there was a giant puddle of caked blood. Splotches of blood leaving the site made it trackable. Clark Armstrong and the crowd followed the pattern to the water's edge, but the grass gave way to dirt. There, they encountered several humanoid tracks. From page 12, Clark talks about Armstrong as, quote, He showed me and a group of 50 other people a large pool of blood near a picnic table and a trail of blood leading from it to the water's edge. Several large tracks were also found. So it was at this point that Ronnie Armstrong began to believe it was an albino ape that had escaped. The only thing that Ronnie was certain about was from page 13, quote, Whatever it is, it sure ain't human. Another set of its tracks were found. And Clark documented this on page 17 as, Three people from Fort Worth drew attention to a set of tracks they found. The tracks measured 16 inches with a toe spread of 8 inches. About 120 people witnessed these tracks. Miss Clark took this photo with Ronnie Armstrong displaying some of the blood. However, in black and white, it's useless. Clark also stated in the book that her investigations had revealed that most of the sightings had taken place in a field, not the trees, road, or gravel pit. Standing before this oak tree, Clark wrote on page 8, Five people said they saw the monster break the big limb on this big oak tree. One more eyewitness from her investigations was Vic Franklin, and she wrote this about him. Quote, Vic Franklin was wielding a bayonet as he searched for it. Vic claimed to have seen it a number of times. He described it as being a human form, very hairy and about seven to seven and a half feet tall. It made a sound like a bear or a lion. One encounter scared him bad enough that he ran for his life. He was embarrassed to admit it and claimed everyone else ran too. Around July 15th or so of 1969, Bill Morris, his cousin, and a few girls went out to Young Family Cemetery that was about three quarters of a mile from the sightings. The coffins were moved to another location and today Lakeside Plaza sits on top of the old cemetery's location. Bill and his cousin saw some armadillos and decided to pop at them with BB guns. As they were plinking at them, they heard a ruckus and a low growl growing from the trees. They all quieted down, and the little shindig came to an end as the growling got louder. They grabbed their lights and shined them into the trees and could see shadows of movement. The girls were terrified. Then, within eyesight, they watched this thing stand tall on two legs. It was bipedal, and it was so stout, they mistook it for a bear. That is, until it began throwing rocks at them. They fled the cemetery, knowing this thing could kill them. There was fear in our hearts at that point, because we knew this thing was real, and he would kill us in a minute. It had to be the Lake Worth monster. It all died down until October of 1969, when monster hunters, curious to get a sight of it, were driving through the park. Alan Plaster leaned out the window, and while they drove, he saw something white stand up, and he snapped this photo. They kept driving, but Plaster feels, quote, Whatever it was, it wanted to be seen. That was a prank. That was somebody out there waiting for people to drive by. I don't think an animal would have acted that way. However, a large number of people have made the point that that thing is much too tall to be a person and much too stout. The encounters died down again, and people started feeling safe to return to Greer Island. Charles Buchanan, an engineer, stopped by the store and bought a barbecue chicken. He drove out to Greer Island to spend the night and do some fishing on November 7th of 1969. He set up some trot lines in the lake and then enjoyed a quiet, calm evening. Charles eventually rolled out his sleeping bag in the back of his pickup truck and fell asleep. Charles was startled awake as an earthquake had struck. As he was getting his bearings, he noticed, quote, I woke up when my pickup tipped. Something was lifting it. Then it dropped it and everything went silent. 
till a massive hairy arm lobbed its arm into the bed of the truck, grabbed Charles still bound in a sleeping bag. It hoisted Charles and the sleeping bag into the air and then dropped them. It was emitting a horrid stench that was so bad it had an effect on Charles even during this panic. Charles had no weapon for defense. He reached into the truck and grabbed his bag of barbecue chicken and shoved it towards the face of this thing. It snapped its jaws onto the chicken, holding the bag and all with its teeth, while terrifying Charles with these hellish sounds. It turned, bolted towards the water, leaped in, and swam rapidly to Greer Island. Charles jumped in his truck and drove to Desert Inn Motel and sheltered there till daylight. Charles described the beast as seven and a half feet tall with long arms and small deformed stubby fingers, having hair all over its body including its face. He also stated it looked like a cross between a man and a gorilla, that it weighed 700 to 1,000 pounds. As he jumped into his truck and began to close the door, he looked down and he saw a footprint. He said the footprint was shaped like a man's, about 18 inches long, and the toes were about two and a half inches long. Sally Ann Clark published the book without ever seeing the monster. Then much later, she encountered and saw it three times. Since then, there have been many sightings, but none of them have been reported in the newspapers. It was claimed that one man was staying in a rehab nearby and claimed he was sneaking in and scaring people with a homemade costume. Another man said, no, 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 it was him. He made the costume to scare off women hanging around his fishing hole. He said he even rolled tires at them. Then about 20 teenagers or more took credit for it. But here's the big question. Why did they all hate money so much? Sally Ann Clark had put up a $5,000 reward, which is $43,000 in today's money as of 2023. All they had to do was admit they're the ones that did it and pass a lie detector. When offered the money in the challenge, every single one of these people backed down, shut up, or disappeared, which means none of them did it. No charges were going to be filed, so it wasn't that they were scared, and they had already admitted this publicly. To this day, there are no credible claimants, but still a crazy amount of people claiming they did it. Yet another person wrote, quote, Goatman was a burned-up gorilla, 300 pounds, 6 feet tall, and able to throw a car tire a long way. Big Buddy, I believe, was his name, and he was an attraction at Casino Beach. Around 1940, a fire destroyed Casino Beach at Lake Worth, he was badly burned but was able to escape to a nearby island about a thousand feet from where he was being held. When the fire came, you could hear him scream for three miles away. The owners of Casino Beach Boardwalk Ballroom claimed he burned up in the fire. But the truth be told, not a trace was ever found, just lots of ashes. The current nature director, Wayne Clark, admits they hear outlandish and spooky sounds still, but leaves it at that. He leans heavily towards the theory that it was a costumed person. Today, as far as I know, Greer Island is not open to the public at night, but you can still visit on rainy and foggy days. Or you can park near the park to investigate, but do not enter park property after hours. From Lake Worth, we head directly south to Bimbrook Lake. On March 13th of 1973, Mark Frick, a 19-year-old that worked security at Carswell Air Force Base, drove out to Holiday Park on Bimbrook Lake. He was unwinding by the shore, drinking a soda, listening to music, and then taking the scenery of the lake. His much-needed relaxation was interrupted by a hellish sound, an eerie howl. Mark craned his neck over to see a large seven-foot creature. He said it was some sort of creature that looked like a, quote, large bear, except it was howling. It was splashing a ruckus in the shallows of the water, and then it disappeared out of sight into a thicket. Mark phoned the police, who took the report serious enough for some reason that they formed a search party but no evidence or trace was located. Someone identified as Jack Lean claimed to have an encounter with a dogman, werewolf, or something at the same spot on October 20th of 2005 as he was swimming in the water. But we'll talk about that in an upcoming Dogman video, which is a great reason why to subscribe to the channel. 
We're going to end this with a creepy story that sounds like it happened recently. From Benbrook Lake, we're going to head directly south to Hamilton, Texas. And this was the message that I got. Not long ago, my girlfriend and I were driving through Hamilton, Texas around 11.30 or so on our way back to Fort Worth. We stopped at a little green food truck, Brandon and Kelly's, I think, for lunch. We both got loaded fries with fajita meat and Dr. Peppers. There was no place to sit, but somebody right there said there was a creek and a path down to it across the street and at the end of the bridge. We got down there and heard a puppy yelping in pain. My girlfriend shouted at me, do something. So I handed her my fries and I followed the noise to a drain pipe. When I got to the mouth of it, there was fresh blood and an inhuman sounding snarl. I froze in terror. My girlfriend heard it too and she called me back. We ran with our fries and Dr. Peppers in hand back to my car. We drove silently for a long time and then she broke down crying. This thing sounded like a demon from a movie with goat sounds, but it was real. I did hours of research online and finally found this. I can't find the site again, but here is what it said. Quote, Hamilton, Pecan Creek Trail. On Highway 36, past the Phillips Station, and before the old antique shop, there is a bridge. Under that bridge lies a bike trail. If you follow the trail north, stop under the Highway 36 bridge, and turn towards the creek, you will see a drainage pipe. Go across to the pipe, crawl in on your hands and knees past two turns. Shine a flashlight down the tunnel, and you should see a head look at you and duck back around the corner. Also, you should hear metal banging ahead of you and grunting noises. Rumor has it that this is some sort of a goatman. End quote. This is real. Someone needs to find out about it, what it is, and a priest or someone needs to destroy it. All right, guys, recently I found out that one of my viewers, Miss Jimmy, went out to Gore Cemetery from the first Goatman video. She explored around looking for Goatman tracks or any signs of it, and she's going to be returning again. I'll leave a link to her video and her channel in the description below. Be sure to check it out. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this episode. But as always, it is super important to hit that like button and even more important to subscribe, especially with all these weird and fantastic videos coming out of treasure hunts, cryptids, abandoned places to explore, spooky and mysterious places, and of course, gym and fossil hunting locations. And until next time, we're off on another adventure. God bless.